Hello and welcome. My name is Sarah Yu Schaefer. I am the facilitator today on behalf of the ESRD National Coordinating Center. Today's Learning in Action Network event is focused on transplant. We have three networks presenting today, and starting September 12th, we did go to a shortened timeline. So I will keep the NCC's opening comments brief and we'll get right into the good stuff. So if you've noted the call is being recorded, we will share out the recording and the deck with the panelists permission to the ESRD network, uh, ESRD networks who can then share it in their network service area. Um, these calls can get kind of large and so everyone is muted. We do encourage you to use chat. I'd like to try that right now. So if everybody could just go over to the chat button, make sure it's toggled to everyone and tell me maybe what state you're in, um, what the weather's like, just to get some check-ins there to make sure that's working. There we go, Florida. Tanya, Allison, great. We get the prize there. All right, great. So we see the chat looks like it's working and things are set up correctly. We will post these uh, material, meeting materials to the ESRD uh, NCC website and also to our YouTube page. And then just one more uh, level setting here about these learning and action networks. Um, we really do like to use chat on these and make them interactive, asking questions of our panelists today and, you know, conversation among attendees. Um, but when you listen to the, you know, to the presentations today, think about how you might be able to use this at your facility, how you can maybe take just one idea and, and take it back um, to where you're working and sharing your learnings and ideas with other colleagues, right? Really trying to transition what we learn here today into action um, for process and outcome improvements um, in this area. So with that, oh, I'm sorry, I have one more. I do want to quick promote our uh, change packages. So the ESRD NCC puts together change packages on a host of topics. Um, you can see there, if you haven't yet used them, if you hold your phone's camera up to the QR code, you'll be directed right to that page. I'll share it again, but these are great playbooks and resources. We do update these every year, and these are data proven interventions taken from interviews that we have with top performing facilities across the country um, every year. So if you haven't checked those out yet, please do. And now we'll get right into the presentations with ESRD Network 7. Susan, Allison. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, this is Allison Batwell with ESRD Network 7. Um, can you go to the next slide? Uh, we decided to present a case study for this LAN. Um, next slide. There we go. Um, this case study was actually originally presented by a wonderful Network 7 Florida social worker on a depression expert teams call. Um, and as a team, when we heard it, we realized that it encompassed so many of our different projects um, in one patient story. And so we decided to look at this from a holistic approach um, from lots of our different projects and then very specifically, obviously, transplant today um, because that really stuck out to us. Next slide. So uh, the case study that was presented um, is that this is a 60-year-old single African-American female. Um, she has an unstable family support system, and that sort of leads to the next bullet point, which is that she sleeps in her car. From my understanding, she has adult children and has the opportunity to live with them, but because of some familial um, issues does not. And so basically, you know, she is homeless, sleeping in her car. Um, she has multiple readmissions to the hospital. Um, the social worker explained that it was almost weekly at one point. Um, and then the part that again stuck out for this land was that she is a failed transplant after seven years and now has been on hold status for a second transplant for greater than five years, and that is due to um, some depression issues that she has and not following up on her yearly um, testing that she has to get done in order to be active on the transplant list. So with that background, I'm going to um, send it over to my colleague, Susan, to talk to us about the transplant and other aspects of this case. Great, Allison. Thanks so much. So looking at it from um, the transplant perspective, um, we look for what barriers are there to transplant. Um, and definitely um, are looking at the depression, 
which would make it def difficult for uh, this patient to follow through with the lengthy and complex process that we know is required for evaluation and waitlisting and um, looking at it from the hospitalization perspective. So looking at the lack of primary care support for required testing um, and evaluation and really follow up um, and the health status uh, of this patient. And then also looking at it through the health equity um, perspective for social determinants of health. So, you know, when we're looking at a patient's um, viability for um, receiving a transplant and staying active on the waiting list, um, family support is something that is definitely required um, by the transplant centers and, um, and as equally is um, stable housing. So, um, you know, those are the, some, some of the barriers that we can see from the transplant perspective that also involve um, the other projects that we may be working on um, from a network perspective. So that in, included and helped us as a network to start some internal discussions about, you know, how to uh, approach um, some of our quality improvement projects and patient needs in kind of a, a more holistic way. Next slide. So thinking about a more holistic approach, um, we want to address um, this patient's barriers and address barriers overall to transplant housing stability. How can we do that? Um, are there community resources? Are there programs um, for, for patients who are, are looking to get a transplant that don't have stable housing? You know, what kind of community resources can we find and programs can um, we um, find to promote and to connect patients and facilities with. Um, looking at the depression, um, referral to mental health providers, you know, how willing is, and if I remember this, some parts of this patient's story and the story of others as well, which is, you know, recognizing depression and being willing to, you know, pursue, um, you know, treatment options for that and connect with mental health providers um, is something that um, we, we need to be able to support patients through. Also access to primary care and having a trusted medical home. Um, so this patient in particular um, is um, able to be involved in this company's integrated kidney care program, which, um, you know, gives patients additional support and navigation, um, you know, for to, to meet their other needs um, as well and as well as helping them through um, issues related to transplant. Next slide. Also, additional um, interventions that we definitely want to make sure that we consider and look at in each one of our um, projects when we're talking about um, looking at, at overall how we can be supportive for patients is motivational interviewing. Um, and, you know, that's a way that we can um, find out really what the patient wants to focus on, what really matters um, to the patient. When we look at this patient's um, needs and the barriers that she's facing, what matters most to her is in, in this particular case, looking at she has had a failed transplant, looking at it from the transplant perspective, um, her first transplant failed after seven years and then she's been on hold for a second transplant um, for a considerable amount of time, you know, is, is, is what does that look like for her? What is her focus still, you know, to get a transplant? And is that something that still matters to her? You know, what, what matters to her the most? And then also looking at peer mentoring. You know, we talk more and more about um, peer mentoring from all different aspects and how helpful that can be for patients, um, including patients that are wanting to pursue a transplant, um, support from transplanted patients to, you know, share their stories and, you know, how they've overcome some of their barriers, as well as support from, um, you know, patients that are currently on the waiting list, currently going through the process for evaluation and workup. And, you know, so it's, it's one of those of shared experience um, that we can, um, connect patients one with the other um, for peer mentoring and for support as well as they address any of their barriers. 
Uh, next slide. So these are some of the resources that we really have talked about um, internally that we provide for each one of our um, quality improvement projects separately, but how can we really uh, approach that differently as we're looking at um, the, the projects that we have with facilities um, addressing uh, all these different focuses of depression, hospitalization, um, you know, even the, the transplant and nursing home and even vaccinations. Um, when we're looking at all these things, what kind of resources do we provide for each one of these um, quality improvement projects, but also how can we work together to make sure that we promote these materials even um, uh, as an example, the dialysis patient depression toolkit um, by the forum, you know, how can we make sure and I integrate that into, um, you know, the resources for the transplant quality improvement activities um, to make sure that that's available um, for patients and we realize how, you know, that, that um, particular toolkit could be helpful to facilities to, to help patients uh, um, with depression and looking at all the change packages that are available through the ESRD NCC, um, you know, related to um, all the different hospitalizations, transplant, home dialysis, um, uh, vaccination, and, you know, patient experience of care. Um, all of these different change packages definitely have things within each one of them that could be helpful to facilities when they're, they're looking for how to assist and support patients um, in, in all, all the different things that matter for them. And then we also have some internal resources as well, um, including, you know, this one um, that you see here on reducing hospitalizations, the questions about you sit down, don't stand. This is something that is just encouraging for um, dialysis facility staff to actually sit down with a patient um, to talk about a recent hospitalization. So um, it gives them the opportunity to one on one again, visit with the patient and see actually what's going on with them so that we can be more helpful to them. So anyway, that's just a review of the resources. Next slide. And that's it for today. So thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Allison. We are going to move to our next presentation, which comes out of ESRD Network 8. And we have Sila and Taji here. Good afternoon. Great. Sorry. This is Taji Valentine. I am representing for the Gulf Coast Operating Group for the Mid-South Region. Um, we are located in Memphis, Tennessee, and it is our South Airways location, Fresenius location. Sheila Beth Beckworth is the social worker for In Center, and I am the social worker for Home Therapy. Next slide. So we're going to talk about more broader spectrum of transplant and our actual processes. So um, I'll be talking more about our organizational overview and our processes um, in what we do from day to day in each one of our modalities. Fresenius Kidney Care, of course, we're located at South Airways in Memphis, Tennessee. Currently in center census is at 106 of 120 patients. Um, that have been referred for transplant. We're open six days a week, and we maintain three shifts, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and TTS. That is for in-center. Home therapy census right now, we're at about 55 patients. Um, our patients come to our clinics two days out of the month, the labs and clinic. Next slide. And our transplant referral process, um, we follow the dual policy process uh, through Fresenius. Um, the social worker generally within the first 30 days, we're discussing and assessing the patients for tr transplant. Um, with ESRD patients within the, 30, the first 30 days of admission and then quarterly, which is every three months after our initial discussion and assessment. And we're talking to them and engaging them and just really um, making sure that they're educated and that they have the information and any questions or needs or concerns that they may have throughout that process. Um, we designate at least one day a week to try and focus on transplant. So generally, typically what that looks like for me on the home therapy side, my Fridays are my 
typical days that I follow up with um, patients about transplant. I'm reviewing our updates from our transplant partners, um, our liaisons and our coordinators at that period of time. And we're communicating with our patients and assessing those needs, any delays or concerns. And dually, we're talking with those liaisons and our partners uh, at the transplant facilities to ensure that they have any information, all the information that they need, if there's follow-up, whether that's uh, demographic information, changes of addresses, telephone numbers, or any information that's gonna help just streamline and make that process smooth. Um, we're updating evaluations and statuses in our transplant tracker and making sure that we continue in the ongoing communication during our um, IDT meetings and just collaboratively across our care team. Our referral process, it has evolved. Um, it's now less time consuming. The social workers are able to send our referrals via eFax, and that has really, really improved the process of being able to get those um, referrals processed and transferred over to our partners in a more effective way. Next slide. Some of the barriers and challenges that we do see um, throughout our transplant process, both in center and home therapy, um, past delays, of course, uh, specific to our COVID pandemic, which was between 2020 and 2022. Our transplant evaluations, listing, COVID vaccine requirement, the increased disconnect within the kidney care community. And what we mean by that, of course, you know, we really had to um, adjust to our new way of life. So moving forward, our kidney community um, had to adapt to changes in how operations, operationally, uh, communications would go at that time. So that created some barriers and challenges for some of our kidney patients, especially the ones who have been on transplant wait lists for long periods of time. From financial and policy perspective, uh, those patients who are uninsured, but particularly those that have immigration issues, those are huge challenges. Um, we do try to be um, partners, um, in, con in connection with our patients to try and access any resources that may be available to help facilitate whatever the needs are of our uninsurable um, community. Um, and also insurance network restrictions. Um, oftentimes um, the transplant centers, depending on the type of uh, insurance, they're unable to um, move forward in the evaluation process due to um, patients being out of network and other other variables that have impact their ability to be able to move forward with transplant. And of course, psychosocial barriers, which uh, our Network 7 partner discussed as well, just a lack of adequate social support, mental health, transportation, financial resources, those psychosocial determinants that really, really impact their ability to be able to move forward through the transplant process. And also missed transplant appointments, uh, lengthy turnarounds to reschedule. Oftentimes our patients are impacted by those external uh, stressors or factors. It may be other uh, family members that have medical issues and our, our kidney uh, patients are responsible to those other family members. Um, it, it may be a host of things that impact them being able to get to those appointments. So we try to facilitate and make sure that we're helping them to be able to provide those support services so they are successful in moving on in the evaluation process without having to um, be considered to be inactive uh, once again. Next slide. Continuing with barriers and challenges, um, patient delays with consent for referrals, hoping for kidney recovery. Um, and by that, what we mean is some of our patients are very hopeful. Um, in theory, they would love to be able to just regain function. And we maintain, you know, that um, aspiration of hope, but realistically, some of them um, in talking with them about where they are in their renal recovery. Um, sometimes 
is not very realistic. So just having those ongoing um, conversations and just an example, I just today had a conversation with, with the patient who's very hopeful about renal recovery and we are hopeful for that, but really um, initiating a conversation realistically about dually uh, providing and allowing them to have uh, multiple options. So we discussed um, extensively, you know, going forward with the evaluation process and throughout that process, of course, there's a wait period. And we try to incorporate some other um, options as well. So we talk a lot about living donors, especially with our patients that do have the support systems or they have the external support communities through churches and other organizations that they're involved in and uh, really try to highlight the living donor aspect of it. And generally that's effective in their perception of what receiving a kidney looks like. A lot of our patients really rely on their past experiences, either through conversations they've had with other people who receive kidneys. And sometimes they're apprehensive, but just continuing to equip them with the knowledge and the educational base. So they're better equipped to make those uh, informed decisions about kidney transplant. Um, some of the other barriers that we face, um, suitability, just BMI goals, health statuses, uh, poor treatment adherence, and mental health. So those are engaging conversations that we want to continue to have with our patients, and we do that on a regular monthly basis. Next slide. Our successes. Um, just being compliant with FKC's policies, timely and scheduled transplant assessments uh, being done, um, any updates, um, just keeping that parallel process of communication, um, as I said earlier, with our partners as well as our patients and anyone else who's involved in that process, their care partners and their support networks. Early education, our patients are introduced to the kidney transplant as a treatment option, usually within the first week of admission, and information continues to be provided verbally and written. Interdisciplinary teams approach, we try to utilize every team member that touches our patient. Uh, the social worker leads the in-service during staff meetings and individually encourages our staff to engage the patients in conversations related to interest in, key, in kidney transplant as a treatment option. Next slide. Our relationships with our transplant centers, maintaining those frequent contacts with our liaisons and coordinators. Uh, we had an opportunity today to um, join in a meeting with one of our transplant center liaisons on this morning with a um, learning share uh, opportunity. And it was very informational informational and very helpful. Um, one of the processes that we follow at South Airways is engaging with them um, in lobby days. We do uh, coordinate and collaborate with those transplant center liaisons and kidney coordinators to uh, facilitate lobby days to just promote that ongoing relationship as well as incorporate that with our patients. So they see visually that we are in communication and we want to remain an active member in their care and that transitional process over to transplant. And of course, motivational interviewing, um, just keeping our patients engaged in that process. And that um, speaks to our lobby days um, that we do host. Advertising, of course, flyers and posters, um, displays in our lobby and treatment areas. We also engage in activities with our patients. We try to promote um, contests and competitions, this, things that are just engaging that involves, gets them involved in that process. And they really seem to enjoy that. It actually promotes better treatment adherence with those patients that may have some challenges with uh, treatment compliance, and that helps with that successful process of showing consistency with treatment adherence. So when it's um, transplant evaluation 
timelines um, and they're reviewing uh, potential candidates for transplant, then that's something that has been um, successfully met at the time that those referrals are received by transplant partners. Next slide. Two successful kidney transplants this year, uh, we were able to celebrate two of our um, kidney patients who successfully received transplants this year. So um, this chart just shows our transplant waitlist growth from 2022, and that would be the blue bar, the dark blue bar, and then the turquoise bar is 2023. So we have made um, some tremendous progress over the months um, in 2023, and we're just continuing to strive towards that same goal. Next slide. Next steps, uh, maximize the utilization of our recent development of the e-referral process. Um, as I said earlier, that has really streamlined our ability to be able to process more referrals and just remaining consistent in our processes. Um, I utilize, like I said, the Fridays to just focus specifically on transplant, and that has been very, very effective. Um, it really helps keep our patients up to date. It keeps our liaisons up to date, and it remains that ongoing communication monthly with our patients. Um, and just continuing our current transplant processes. Next slide. Questions, comments? Thank you so much. Thank you, Taji Celia. There were a few questions perhaps um, you can answer those in chat. I do want to keep us moving. Network 9 is presenting next. Um, while we shorten the time frame to 30 minutes, we understand we might go a little bit over that. So if you can, uh, please do hang tight for the ESRD Network 9 presentation next. Vicki? Hi. Uh, yeah, you can go to the next slide, Sarah. So we're going to talk about a new mobile app that we've released called Transplant Center Compare um, and some of the things that are happening that are kind of our quick wins, early successes, and where we hope to go with this. Next slide. Network 9 is actually uh, the states of Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. Um, but this program that I'm talking about, we've actually been able to expand to cover all 13 states that the IPRO ESRD network um, manages. Next slide. So what am I talking about? Well, there's a new program that we've developed a mobile app that's called Kidney Transplant Compare. It is an app that once downloaded, um, uh, individuals can learn about kidney transplant. They can hear and read patient stories. Uh, they can look for transplant centers and in their area, they put a radius, a mile radius in, and it can pick that up or they can search by a particular center name. And if they find two centers that they're interested in, say a 50 mile radius, they can actually compare key components about the um, exclusion or absolute relative criteria uh, with that program. So it lets the uh, patient decide if I have a BMI, what program would be better? A BMI issue that I'm too high for my local program. If I drive 50 more miles, can I go to a program that would accept me with my BMI? It also has information about their transplant outcomes, as well as many of the programs that they offer. Um, say overnight parking for free, housing, some transplant centers have one day evaluation services. So. All of our transplant centers have put the unique aspects of those services into this program so patients can compare that as well. Next slide. So how did this all start? Well, way back when in Network 9, we realized that we wanted to um, share with patients the information um, that was so hard to find on transplant center websites about you know, what the transplant center considered acceptable for transplant, what they might have to get more testing or be evaluated about, and some of the other things that are just good services and support for patients, um, peer groups, et cetera, that um, patients were interested in. So we worked with our transplant coalition in the area, which was a body of ESRD um, dialysis facilities, transplant centers, and the um, patients in our area to build this PDF that you see that lived on our website for the last four years or so for every transplant center. Uh, right now, we've expanded this data to cover the 13 states that are in IPRO. 
uh, which is um, the New England states, uh, the Network 6, which is North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and New York, and the three states of Network 9 that I already shared. Next slide. So in 2023, we heard from the patients that this is really great. We can look at all this stuff, but we got to print it. We got to put it up against each other. We got to try to read all this. And we knew going forward that we needed something that used technology, just like you compare a TV, if you will, to make a decision. What is the best transplant center for us and have it all in one area? And so we created a mobile app that is called Transplant Center Compare, Kidney Transplant Compare. It's free for anyone to download and take a look at. We did a soft launch in June and a hard launch as of July. We have, this is a little out of date, we actually have 40 of our transplant centers of the 47 that are in the 13 states um, participating in this. So they've sent us all their data. Um, and these are some of the flyers, et cetera, that we're releasing to help share that information amongst our community. Next slide. Um, so, you know, what we've done, we've had a social media campaign. We have a three-part demo series. We've done a podcast on this already. We've shared this with our patient groups. Um, and so far, well, actually, I have an update to this too. We're over 364 downloads of the app, and we have about 800 total users. Uh, so um, we're really picking up in terms of the amount of users. Next slide. So this is what I really wanted to get to. I know our time is short, um, but you know, after the launch and we've reshared flyers, um, there's been a very good response. Patients and facilities really like to use this because uh, it helps them make decisions and quickly know what they're um, what they're considering in a transplant center. Next slide. And uh, these were some of the stories and 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 um, pieces of information that our network has shared with us. Many of the states they're sharing this. Um, so these are the stories that make my heart happy when I hear that patients use these to make some good decisions. We had um, one patient who chose a facility over another because they saw that there was less time on the wait list. Uh, we had a person who was otherwise held up by BMI that went to a different facility and was in the transplant workup, as well as these stories on the list here. Next slide. And um, you know we are hearing that people are getting more excited and seeing other places they can list and they're getting onto multiple listing. So all the way around, uh, we've heard from social workers that like to pull up the app at the chair side and go through it with patients, makes it very easy. Um, and uh, you know something that they can talk and, and actually look and make decisions with the patients right then and there. Next slide. And then this is more about the engagement um, you know, and what, how they use it. And I'm sorry to be going so fast. I know we're over time, um, but I know these slides will be shared so you can read these individual comments. But again, this is the stuff that kind of makes your job worth it when you hear people saying how happy they are with the outcomes and what they've been able to use this for. Next slide. So future work, um, we want to uh, work with the centers, the transplant centers in our states that haven't joined yet. So we have another seven to get on board. We want to see how this goes forward with sustainability um, and using some videos to promote it. And um, we're looking to align it with the transplant change packet for work with our future coalitions. So this would be picking drivers, things of that nature that um, would help them to align and get their transplant programs moving forward. Um, next slide. And this is just an understanding of some of the things that we might be able to program in for it to align with the transplant change packet. So I know that that is, uh, no, kidney transplant compare is not in Southern California. Like I said, um, we wanted to share this application. There is a lot of requests for this to be something that is nationally available. Um, we are unsure how that would go, but um, that is something that should, you know, we are considering to look at and, and how the future would be. We wanted to test and show it. I think there's an incredible amount of interest. And the best thing that I can say is that, you know, putting the patients and the family in the driver's seat with all these decisions and having this information has been very powerful and I think is the way that we can go with this. 
So Excellent. Sarah, I see lots of questions about where it's available. So maybe I just need to give a list of the states or something. Sure, or... I can send that out. Or if you want to pop that in chat, I'll just do the closing comments here for the NCC. I know everyone's very excited about this. It was excellent. Uh, thank you also to Allison and Susan, um, Taji and Celia for their time today. Just going to have a quick close for us before we wrap. And that is right to take what we learned here today, um, or, you know, what you liked, what you saw, and make sure that you move it into action when you get back to your facility um, and your daily practice. And if you didn't grab it earlier, there is the QR code to the list of ESRD NCC change packages. We have one for transplant. We have them for um, a host of topics. And then just one last plug here, um, do find and follow us on social media. And when we close this call, there'll be a very short survey. Um, if you can please take that survey, um, even just the first question, if you enjoy the 30 minute format, the 60 minute format, or really it depends on your schedule. We want to ensure here at the NCC that we are meeting the needs for the professionals doing this work. So thank you so much. Excellent today. Thank you the presenters. Have a great day.